All right, just a quick audio check. Um, let me know if all is okay. I can't. I'm seeing like a slight delay with the the camera, so I don't know what's going on. Um, I'm gonna have to turn it off then turn it on. Who knows? Uh, let's see here. J5 USB device. I got a FaceTime camera, and of course it requires me to drop down resolution to 30. Simple. One day I'll get this right. Okay. So this one kind of is like that. And then I could switch it back. And then to J5 USB device. 1920 by 1080. Simple FPS values. 60 frames per second. Well. Okay. So good evening here from somewhere in New Jersey and I hope um, everybody's well and I hope everybody had a fun weekend I see Paul W1 VLF and then um, yeah I think I got rid of the delay um, well we'll see if it comes back so this thing could be unpredictable yeah this camera is great for recording but for um, live streaming it kind of you know, dealer's choice. So anyway, um, yeah, okay, great. Fine now. Okay. All right, so good evening. So last night, if you were on um, on a channel, you saw I talked about various things that are going on in Radio Land in terms of commemoration of all of the latest and greatest um, commemoration of historical radio events. So I thought maybe I could talk about some of these historical radio events and see how we're, you know, what else is coming up in the, the, um, in the future. All right. So if you're new here, I am Ria, call sign N2RJ. I am a ham radio operator. Of course, you, most of you probably know that. I think most of you, I think most of you know me. Anyway. And, um, on this channel, we talk about amateur radio. We talk about other kinds of radio. And we talk about, uh, I don't know, anything you want to. You know, so. But, oh, I also talk about backup power, solar, renewable energy, and stuff like that. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. And let me see if my chat thingy is working. Uh-huh. And let me see here. I hate that. Oh my God. Bang. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna have to do something else. Hang on. I'm just gonna use the internal camera. Use preset. Okay, FaceTime camera. J5 USB. Okay. Is it going to happen again? Yeah? No? <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. It says use a keyframe frequency. Uh, okay. Whatever. All right. <laughs> Best YouTube live stream on the YouTubes. Thank you. I hope you mean it, but we'll, you know. Right. Um, it's fine. Okay, Paul. So anyway, as we were saying last night, you know, so back then, um, anyway, yeah, so introductions out of the way. I'm Ria, you know who I am. And, um, you know, give it a thumbs up if you can. And um, one second delay. Okay. All right. It's not cooperating. I'm not even going to bother. All right. Right. Okay. <laughs> lip sync is good now. You know, when we talk about lip sync, we're talking about like MC Hammer or Millie Vanilli or that's a throwback for some people. Um, no, MC Hammer used to actually sing his own songs, I think. I don't think, but Millie Vanilli, I think, was a lip sync guy, right? <laughs> That's some real 80s throwback there. 80s, 90s. 
you know um and then huh oh well all right well thank you theo that's always appreciated always glad to be making a difference and you know um despite what some people say you know um some people some people like to to criticize and you know troll and stuff like that i actually went through a cleaning exercise on twitter and youtubes and stuff too and um i kind of got rid of some toxic people so if you, you know who you are if you want to remain toxic you can't remain in my world so that's just it you know i keep, prefer to keep it positive um hi joseph how are you doing hi lon uh how are you doing and then um edward i don't know how to pronounce your last name i'm very sorry um chris down there in florida Chris, I'm going to see you for Orlando, you know? I want to make sure I see you for Orlando because I'm looking, f I'm so looking forward to Orlando. Orlando is going to be great, you know? And Covain, nice to see you too. See? Okay. Claire, right. So anyway, yes. So yeah, last night, DWRL, the Radio Club of America, and other radio um, organizations, I, Antique Wireless Museum in Connecticut, they did a whole commemoration of the 1921 transatlantic test, right? And um, I'm not really a history buff, you know. I do like to, to note radio history, so um, most of all. And even in um, the ARL Hudson Division website, which I curate, and I've been looking for help, I actually have a little section on history, which I could show you now. And... Um, Hi, Ben. Um, Daft Punk, or actually Rob and Fab. <laughs> yeah, Chris, it's going to be a fun time. Um, hi, Ben. Okay. And, yeah, so um, let me show you a little bit of what I cobbled together. Um, hi, Joe. How's it going? I know I'm going to see you at Orlando, too, right? Of course. Of course I'm going to see you at Orlando. I know you wouldn't miss it for the world. And we have to do some soldering. I have a, I have, I'm going to um, show one of these soldering tools that Joe introduced me to on the channel. He actually did um, show it on a live stream. So let me get this web browser going. And, um, uh, okay. Yeah, so um, I started a history page for the ARRL. Uh, you know just to um to actually document some of the history of of awrl and i've been it's been some really fascinating stuff so right and then so but first one of the things that um that really struck me was you know hiram percy maxim back in the day he wrote an article called the reason why and he wrote about how a, a bunch of organizations were um you know, he, well, he talked about the AWRL and politics and stuff like that. And I mean, let's face it, AWRL politics is part of my life now. Okay. So, you know, I might as well not run from it. Um, yeah. He had the visions of early ARL directors meetings. He see the old times grappling with problems of organization with QRM, with trunk line traffic and rival amateur leagues. I see sinister commercial and government interests. Um, so you can exterminate amateur radio. Those were days. Those were early ones. Hi, Carlisle. Nice to see you here. And of course, the smoking ape. Um, hey, the smoking ape. Uh, thank you for the support, and thank you for for joining in. So um, yeah. So uh, today, I see amateur radio an institution recognized by the American government on the road to recognitions by other governments on the world. You see a fine loyal. AWRL membership for 20,000, standing shoulder to shoulder, blazing the way in brotherhood, um, IERU. And um, he said, uh, I asked how it all came about, that the AWRL should have succeeded and all his opponents failed. The answer is clear, is because our opponents, there was always some kind of selfish motive from the beginning. And whereas in ARL, we insisted that from the beginning that no selfish motive for anybody or anything should ever prevail. Everything that ARL undertakes must be 100% for the general good. 
that policy bred loyalty and confidence with those two things an organization can prosper forever so you know he was quite passionate about his little radio relay league that he actually put together and um you know i kind of reading i read so like occasionally i go through like a lot of the old qsts and such like that the articles from back in the days and you know just to see how it was i saw about the early field days for example they had where they were testing portable stations and it was quite it's quite fascinating so um in my um division hudson hudson division which is eastern new york new york city long island and um, northern new jersey um you know i actually did a little research into history here so in 1917 they would you believe that there are only six the Ada world was divided up into six divisions and um they actually created um one of the um thank you ben ben uh super chat always appreciated and um always uh welcome so let me see here all right and thank you you see that the super chat even shows up on the the plugin this plugin is the cat's meow okay if you use an obs you want this okay all right okay so um yeah and thanks for helping me beta test it um ben so yeah so um so yeah so this this area used to be part of the new england division and then they carved it out because new york city was such a uh, a hub of radioactivity right they had like radio row and all sorts of other places you know that um that dealt with radio so they they have um kb warner and remember kb warner we actually talked about in that other video kb warner was the secretary of the awrl who famously bet the hat okay the hat that for the transatlantic tests so um yeah here they lay out the the hudson division and then they had a convention in um at the grand um ballroom um ape it's um uh you know what um it is by aaron pk for obs right i'll tell you whoops um here I, I lost it yeah uh let's see here Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I'll send it to you. So um, it's at AaronPK.TV. It's for comments. Right? Okay. Yeah, so they had, um, you know, they had their, their, their first ever district convention held at Hotel Pennsylvania in New York City. In 1926, they held the, the division convention in, um, uh, where was it? I think they held it in New York City. And um, Dr. A. Lafayette Walsh, W2BW. Um, so he became, he was one of my predecessors. You know, the funny thing is, as I mentioned here, he, <laughs> he was famous in the New York newspapers because his house, the gas, I think it was, I don't think it was natural gas at the time. I think it was town gas, right? Um, they had um, the town gas, they left on the town gas, and exploded his house exploded i think it was in his house was either in manhattan or queens or something new jersey my home state um hosted a division convention here in uh, the 1930s and then um so I, I have to continue a lot of this but you know there's a lot of fascinating history here okay so let's talk about the transatlantic test so i actually went and i did a lot of research into this video and then um I have to give full credit to w to one bcg.org and also the RSGB, right? So this is the website I actually used to um okay, just making sure I'm actually looking here. Yeah. To actually do the video about the transatlantic test. They have a complete wealth of information, okay? They are like, you know, they are the best. Of course, they had um and they have they showed you like the 1921 transmitter okay you see this was the transmitter in a shed okay i make this a little bigger right this thing literally screams keep your hands in your pocket and don't take them out and don't touch nothing you know 
And uh, so, yeah. Yeah, Ape, you know what? I agree. Those old Shaq picks are awesome, you know? And uh, Nigel, good evening to you. Brian, also good evening to you, too. Yeah, so, you know, these old Shaqs, you know, these old Shaqs are really part of history, you know? But, yeah, you know, you look at this, okay? You see, like, here you have the, you have these um, coils here out in the open. You have three tubes. My God, this is a kilowatt amplifier they're talking about here. And they have the little generator in the corner. And they have <laughs> they have metering up on the walls. You know, you trip inside of this thing, you're going to fry. You're going to fricassee your brains out, right? And the top here, you have the coil going to the antenna with these big insulators. So here they have the whole uh, diagram of this. They have the motor generator to provide the the um, A power supply and then they had I guess the B battery somewhere with the filaments and then they had um, so initially what they did was they were going to have this as a as a self-excited design basically the whole thing would have been an oscillator right the whole thing would have been an oscillator instead that became too unstable more unstable believe it or not than the actual transmitter turned out to be so they actually had like one master oscillator one tube and then they got three more tubes as a power amplifier. So that, that pretty much worked out for them. And these were the tubes, you know, these were like, these were probably hand blown, probably. Uh, and um, they look like light bulbs. This was the UV204. Uh, <laughs> at least one hand, Ed. Yes, of course. So your current doesn't go through the heart. Yeah, UV204 triode, right? Then um, they had the, the, they actually donated the transmitter to Columbia University. You know. uh, incidentally, I used to do VE sessions at Columbia University with Alan Crosswell and 2YGK. They, have a, they still have a pretty decent ham radio club. Now they do virtual exams. I think their shack is still closed, believe it or not. But here's the antenna. People have been asking about the antenna. So basically it's like a, a cage but it's um, top loaded. So, you know, you couldn't have like a full wavelength thing. So they basically top loaded this thing at 70 feet and they put two 50 feet elements side by side, right? Yeah, so they put a flat top. And this was a common design for antennas back in the day. Um, you know, even for broadcast stations, you notice a lot of old broadcast stations, they had these antennas, these t-tops these marconis and such like that and then eventually later on they just went with a straight monopole and of course if they needed patterns they have to to actually go and um put multiple um multiple tra um, towers then they put the radial field of course right so they had a counterpoise and then they had the crew so the thing about the crew is that um, when they're, you know, you know, they say the best time to put up an antenna is when it has bad weather. Well, apparently that's true here because these guys, when their guys were putting up the antenna, they decided to, you know, the snow decided to fall. So um, that's cool. So I want to look at the RSGB transatlantic test page. They have a whole wealth of information. Okay. And they have a whole, so this initial um, transatlantic test, and I use a lot of, of, um, of this for, to, you know, do research for the video. So initially, initially, they had one set of tests that they failed, right? They, the first one, they planned it in the early part of the year, but um, they didn't have anything. And then Kenneth Warner, the secretary, KB Warner, he, you know, he wanted to, to sweeten the pot. He put a, 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 a spring hat as a prize. And then what happened is a hat maker bet against them and said, yeah, okay, we'll sponsor a hat because we don't believe you guys could do it, okay? <laughs> so, um, yeah, they, you know. And back then, the situation was, like I mentioned, that um, during the... When the Titanic sank, the government, of course, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? Because that's how the government reacts. You know, they're very reactionary. And um, hi, Paperwork Ninja. Good evening to you. 
And, you know, they, they put this thing called the Radio Act of 1912, which actually was the beginning of licensing of all radio. So all radio became licensed at that time. And they put in the regulations, all non-commercial stations, meaning amateurs, had to operate 200 meters and down. Okay? So they, because they figured that the lowest frequencies were not good for DX, so... Sorry, the lowest frequencies were good for DX, and these higher useless frequencies, we'll just give them to the hobbyists, because we don't care about the hobbyists, okay? And um, they did that, and then the hobbyists said, well, let's see if we could use these useless frequencies to make contacts, and we'll show them. <laughs> so anyway, um, and then, of course, Hiram Percy Maxim and Clarence Tusca, they founded the ARRL in 1914. They tried to set it up with the Hartford Wireless Club and Hartford Radio Club and then Hartford Radio Club and then fell out. So Hiram Maxim formed his own thing with Clarence Tusca and the rest is history. Of course, then the war came about, you know, I don't know, all these wars in history. That was World War I when everything was going on in Germany and all that kind of stuff, you know, and it was a very terrible time. Of course, the Holocaust and stuff was serious business and the other stuff going on in world war one that was terrible and um you know they just really you know terrible so anyway um okay so yeah they had um some of these magazines said that how you know they they decided to 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 set the plans in motion and they had all these here and of course qst you know they used to really have some artistic covers back then you know you see this qst and it reminds me of computer magazine in the 1980s but qst had this nice cover valentine's day of course with a heart and cupid and this woman here operating the radio and you see they had women operating the radio back then too you know so yeah i'm sorry i'm at world war ii my mistake. Yeah, Holocaust was World War Two. I meant wars in general, you know? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, World War One was, was some different, of course. And then World War Two had... I'm going to be like KMRD. KMRD said the Japanese came in the 1950s. That's, you know, they bombed Pearl Harbor in the 1940s. So, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean that the Holocaust happened in World War One. I meant that happened in one of the world wars, which was World War II. Okay. All right. All right. So the transatlantic tests. Um, right. So, by the way, the two world wars shut amateur radio down completely. Because they basically took the amateurs. And the first one almost killed it fully. You know? Um. <laughs> yeah. The first one almost ended it permanently because what happened was after afterwards Hiram Percy Maxim um, and the AWRL had to fight to get back the the frequencies. Amateurs weren't even allowed to listen to radio back then, you know, when the war was over. And then eventually we got our receiving privileges back, which was wild, you know. Here today, anybody you can um, you can pretty much, you know, um, buy a radio, buy a Baofeng and get on the air. Uh, yeah. Um, Tosca, Clarence Tosca, you know, I don't hear much about him really. He kind of faded away after the league was founded. I don't know exactly what happened to him. I knew he was a secretary at one time and then, um, I really have to figure that out. You know, he, he just, I don't know. You know, I, I that that's a good that's a good point. Um, okay, yeah. It was recognized that the three nights were too few, as conditions were known to vary. Anybody who DXs on 160 meters will know that sometimes you have to wait a while. You want to know something really strange? When I was trying to work Japan on 160, I waited a whole month for the propagation. Okay. And I literally got up early in the morning around the gray line to look for Japan. One morning, I saw a signal in, um, 
you know, on CW on, on 160. And I called him and he called me back and we made the contact and we were good. You know, Japan. But yeah, so, you know, you have to, as a 160 meter operator, you have to basically kind of train yourself to look into this. Anyway, from the other reasons for failure, it was recognized that three nights were too few. Conditions were known to vary. It was also known that winter conditions favored DX propagation on 200 meters. So the next set of tests would have to wait until December. So that's the other thing. During the, the dark months, right, the darker months in the northern hemisphere, you'll find that propagation on 160 was a lot better. So even today, of course, you know, nature doesn't really change all that much. But um, even today, you'll find out that um, the... Um, even today, you'll find that, that the best DX time for 160 is basically around December, basically, you know, late in the year. When the days are shorter, this way you have more darkness. Common. We have this thing we call common darkness where both areas are in darkness or they're on the gray line. And this is the best time to work them on 160. So hence why they chose December because one, they would get um, better propagation. And two, because it's cold, because the winter, they would have less you know, fewer static crashes and less atmospherics and stuff like that because the first tests were actually interfered with heavily by crashes and atmospherics. Now, they did this at the convention and then godly, they, you know, they decided to send an American to, to England called Paul, his name was um, Paul Godley and that caused a stir. You know, they really were kind of like, you know, ticked off that, um, <laughs> that they would send an American to help with, uh, you know, with, with ham radio in listening in, in the UK, right, Scotland. But um, they actually, you know, figured, well, they would do it anyway. And back then, you know, they had quote-unquote influencers, people doing product and endorsements and such like that. And then <laughs> Paul Godley chooses these tubes. You know, AP tubes, that's hilarious. I remember a few years ago, actually, um, John Devildare, ON4UN, uh, he was actually pictured in ads in CQ and QST magazine, and the ads used to read, um, what kind of radio does John ON4UN use to work DX? And then they had a pair of 10-tech or Orions, and they used to said he uses a pair of 10-tech Orions. So 10-tech the radio company actually used that for him. So anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, they, you know, like I said, in um, England was not too happy with that, you know. And then <laughs> the cartoons and such, you know, the cartoons were really hilarious. This year they had them on the calendar, and I have the book too with all the old cartoons from, from um Gill, and uh, these was, these were interesting. But they they had other cartoons, and you could tell these are old style cartoons. All right, okay. Um, let's see, part two. I don't think I went into part two. Yeah. So Paul got the hard boiled ham. Okay. So he wins the bet, and he got the spring hat. Okay. He heard the station, and they, you know. So the thing about the low bands is that you not only have to transmit a good signal. But you especially have to receive. And you, looking at this back then, okay, you will see that Godly teamed up with great people like Harold Beveridge, okay, and um, talking about um, this, you know, this long antenna that would be you that could be used, you know. And all these people we, you know, we know as icons in amateur radio history, they kind of teamed up to do this. You know, it's like a dream team. So, yeah, so he received on an um, definite uh, U.S. signals being heard, okay? And um, he wished he had a transmitter. You know, you ever wish you go somewhere and you had a transmitter? So, 
<laughs> said he would give a year of his life for a one kilowatt tube transmitter and um, a British post office license. Back then, the post office used to issue ham radio licenses. Yeah. So, he has a whole um, log. And um, I want to show you something else, too, actually, where I have... And let me see if I can find it here. Somebody sent me, like, a whole diary of um, tests that they were doing. And Paul Godley. So, let me bring that up here. This is some fascinating stuff. You're going to get a kick out of this. Mm. Let me see here. Uh, Adobe. There we go. Rain. So this guy had a whole handwritten notebook of stuff. Okay. I got a, I got a scan of this. And... Um, Sunday, December 4th, uh, he checked into his hotel, the weather with heavy fog. He slept until noon in an effort to get warm. After midday, he went out to um, work over Glasgow, but child gave it up. Was so chilled, gave it up after two hours. Yeah. And he wrote a whole blo uh, a blog. He wrote a whole diary about this, you know. And then um, he had, uh, you know, the weather, and he made a whole note about this. So this one is interesting. I might actually, I think there's a web link for this somewhere. I'll see if I could find the link and put it down. But um, so, yeah, so he actually, you know, you could see his whole diary, right? And um, he actually had a whole whole journal of this thing. Day by day, blow by blow, right? And he talks about um, December 7th, the weather again, all my clothes wet and heavy cold on, you know, meet me at the hotel, just getting light. This actually sounds like a de-expedition log, you know? <laughs> yeah. And he talked about the amplifier and stuff like that. A whole, this is a whole read, but I want to fast forward to the section where he actually received stuff. So, right? So December 10th, 10th and 11th, Saturday and Sunday. And um, got on job a bit before 12. Feeling very fit. Extra bit of sleep during the afternoon, evening. It was most worn out. Okay. He had his um, hundred uh, thousand cycle amplification frequency. Can this be better than leaving amplifier and autodyne? Get set about twelve fifty, few minutes. Okay, and then um, here we have the reception reports faded out, uh, weak but unreadable, faded out, return a bit static. Heavier, faded out 10 seconds and back. Faded out, steady weak, very weak and steady, coming up very strong and steady. Fades a bit. Long dash, very strong and steady. Fades a bit, but back again. Very strong, very steady. And then, um, yeah, so he documents this whole thing here. Okay. And uh, test VV from what we want BC, RR, VVV. And he copies a message, falls off a bit, said, um, yeah, so he wrote a whole thing about this, you know. Right, so, I mean, you know, you could tell that, that there was quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of detail these guys wrote in this thing here. And what else I want to do here now? I want to go back to the browser. Uh, let's see. Okay. Right. So what I want to show you from the RSGB page as well, too. Um, yeah, this was the diary here. Key page from his. Uh, so, you know, this the tests were successful. <laughs> oh, and they, they were really colorful when they wrote this magazine. Oh, Mr. Printer, how many exclamation points have you got? 
trot them all out because we're going to need them badly because we got across. <laughs> they were very celebratory, you know. And they, they're, um, of course, the, the hat, the now famous hat. Now you know where those QST covers came from and the um, RSGB's Radcom. And they have um, the cover. Okay. And, um, yeah, they went and they, they did a lot of um, stuff. So um, if you're in England, actually, you can use um, slash 2ZE to use to uh, append it to your call sign. I wish I was there. I mean, I have a call sign there. I can actually go and, and use it. So slash 2ZE. And um, any radio amateur in the UK or Crown dependencies may participate in these call signs routing the suffix slash 2ZE to their station's normal call sign. This will apply from 1 to 26 December 2021 does not require any individual authorization, the S, from Ofcom. You know? Hmm. Interesting. So last night, I actually went on the air, and um, I figured I would chase these stations and have uh, a good, um, you know, a good time. W1AW, they did a live stream, and I, I got on there. I got in there, I think I was the ninth contact they made, right, excluding dupes. So the ninth contact they made, the first one was K7GM. I think he was using a remote. And K7GM is actually the treasurer for the ARRL. He, um, he was, you know, he got in quick. And we had a little back chatter with myself and Rick Roderick and the rest of them. And <laughs> Rick got in a lot later, you know. <laughs> I'm like... Yes, I got in before him. I got in before K1ZZ. I got in before a lot of people, okay? <laughs> so I felt very happy. <laughs> yeah. So Radcom still exists. I actually have it as um, a member of RSGB. So it's, um, it's interesting. Interesting magazine. Clarence Tosca. You know, that's a good question about Clarence Tosca. So Clarence D. Tosca. And, um, yeah, he, um, he actually died in 1985. Wow. Okay. That's something else. Okay. Uh, did he really die in 1985? He was like 88 years old. Darn. Okay. 30 words a minute. I don't think they were doing 30 words a minute, you know? I don't know. I mean, you know. So let me look in the Wikipedia here and I'll show you what I see about Clarence Tusca. Somebody asked about Clarence Tusca. He was born August 15th and he died in 1985. Okay. I was alive when Clarence was alive. Okay. Now you know how old I am. Along with Hiram Percy Maxim of the ARL. And um, he was the original editor and owner of QST which he sold to the ARL in 1919 as part of his reorientation toward professional activity. So, yeah, so what happened is, like, Clarence Tosca, he started off in the ARRL, and then he went into commercial radio, and then he basically just left it in 1919. Um, and then he basically quit the ARRL. Okay. That that's fair, you know. And then um, 1917, uh, Tusca hoped to continue publishing. Um, yeah, and the magazine suspended until September 1917, and Tusca was in the Army Signal Corps, and then he returned to Hartford. So he was one A Y. Okay. And then and, um, he was a head of household, living with his grandmother and mother, who were both widowed. He became focused on Ernst. So, yeah, so he basically left amateur radio. You know, that, that's kind of sad. You know, there, there are a lot of radio engineers who could play both sides of the fence, but, you know, I guess he just wanted to spend his time making, making money. And he established um, a company. And then he... Uh, huh, Tosca Radio. Interesting stuff. 
He made radios. I bet my friends at New Jersey Antique Radio Club, right? All right, Jimmy, I'll click off the banner. Um, Tusca Radio, The Sandman Story, uh, Radio Station WQB. Okay. Huh. And, wow, okay. He established on the Hartford's Koran, WDAK. Huh, interesting. So he lived in Heightstown, New Jersey, and then he lived in Cranberry, New Jersey. Okay, and then, wow, okay, cool beans. Yeah, so Clarence Tusca led quite a life after amateur radio, so I guess he, he kind of was like a ham who, who left everything, you know. I can't believe it, you know, I just can't believe it. He's um he's one of those things I learned something tonight. So one of the other things I talked about recently, and I actually did a video early on, was um Fessenden. And one thing I'm going to be doing with um Fessenden is I'm going to see if I can live stream the transmissions like I did last year. Was it last year? Yeah. And then um that got picked up by a few media outlets. It got picked up by the Washington Post, and it got picked up by a few others. So I might, on this channel, you will see, you'll probably see a live stream of the Fessenden um, recreation. There is a ham who always does it, and this ham always has some, you know, he has some fascination with all sorts of radio communication. So those of you who don't know about Reginald Fessenden, He is one of the people who claims to have made the first radio broadcast. And for that, he used an Alexanderson alternator. And, um, you know, at one time, I believe he used the alternator to make the broadcast. And um, so, well, he, I know he had an alternator for his, um, some of his endeavors, right? So Reginald Fasson then, he was um, born in, in Canada, right? And he did a lot of his work in the U.S. And he, his father was American, apparently. So he did, um, yeah, Fazenden, right. Um, Fazenden, or was that, um, was that um, uh, Tosca, D Brian? Did he wind up working RCA vetting patents? Yeah, he claims, you know, um, so there's a little, Frank, there's a little bit of controversy regarding Fezzan and, and the first en entertainment radio broadcast, okay? Some people claimed that it was Lee DeForest who actually made the first broadcast, right? And, you know, Lee DeForest, of course, um, Fezzan and kind of like, you know, he's like, well, no, he didn't, you know, um, so... Um, I mean, you know, it's kind of like a cute story that, that never dies. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know what happened. If Tosca might've done that later in his years. So yeah, you know, and there are a lot of people even today who are trying to debunk Fazanen's achievements and such like that, but I still think it's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, the first broadcasts were, um, Beginning in 19, well, that's Lee DeForest, right? And then, uh, let's see here. 1932. Mm, 1906, he made two radio broadcasts of music and entertainment to a general audience using an alternator, right, at Brant Rock. So, um, <laughs> DeForest was remembered a fool. Hey, you know what? Let me tell you, I have, my <laughs> uh, who me? I, I have no, uh, you know what? I don't know what Armstrong really, I have no opinion on, um, Armstrong's ego. Look, if you say Fezzanen did it, I did. Uh, when I made my video about Fezzanen, I did it to, you know, and I, I said that he made the first broadcast, but there is always some dispute and oh, people are going to claim one thing and then the other. So, you know, the way I put it was that um, Fezzanen claimed to make the first entertainment broadcast. 
And, you know, so that is an accurate statement. And then Lee DeForest did some broadcasts too, but um, he was he was the first person to transmit music. You know, Fezzanin um, was probably the first, and then Lee DeForest kind of claimed it too, so both of them claimed, you know. All right, Frank, you're out of here. So, you know. Yeah. Sorry, I don't tolerate that nonsense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't tolerate trolling. Sorry. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Um back back to this thing. We saw Armstrong Tower he did from um Yeah, you know Joe, um so when Joe Eisenberg was here, uh he actually um came and um you know we went we drove around and we went to the alpine tower and um armstrong armstrong where armstrong did his experiments and such like that and they actually still do transmit from that tower for special events and such like that so and joe took some great pictures of it i you know i was really it was really nice I, I wonder if I could fly a drone nearby. I don't think I could fly straight up to the tower. One, because they might get mad. And two, um, <laughs> two they might kind of, you know, it might kind of interfere with the magnetic compass on the drone. So I have to see. Um, Mel, uh, have I gone to WRMI? I wish I could go, um, you know, which one radio station? I'll probably go. Yeah, and Edison and Tesla was a different... I mean, that was brutal, okay? That was where Edison used to take um, and basically put things in the um, in the field. Um, he killed an elephant. He basically, you know, used to bad talk, used to really say all sorts of stuff about Tesla and Westinghouse and say that how those guys were, you know, that how their, their alternating current is dangerous and all that stuff. You know, so, yeah. Um, yep. Okay. So, yeah. So, anyway. So, I have this other video on Fessenden. Fessenden was pretty pretty interesting, too. He was, um, but I understand that he had quite a temper. Probably like Frank, who he just booted from the channel. And um, Fessenden actually... You know, he had quite a quite a temper here. I'm trying to find a section here. Um, let's see here. Yeah. So he had a reputation for being temperamental. Although his defense, his wife later later said that Fez, Fezenen was never a difficult man to work with, but he was intense, intensely difficult man to play politics with. He said. Um, Recall that he was a great character, splendid physique, but with a temper. He could be very nice at times, but only at times. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. So that's um, that's some interesting history about broadcasting. So I'm going to be having this on this channel coming up. I'm not going to do another video on Fessenden. I'm just going to recreate the broadcast. All right. If you want to go and look at the old video, the old video is back there somewhere last year. In the beginning of when this channel was actually producing videos and such like that, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll try not to. You know, I'll just notch him out. Um, Joe, so let me tell you something, Joe. It's really interesting because Ken Heron, who's a, a, a famous YouTube drone pilot, okay, he goes all over the place and he flies his drone and he actually flew it near a UHF TV tower and the drone began to show compass errors. But the drone remained in the sky, okay? It didn't fall down or land, auto land or anything, you know. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of risky. I might figure I might put a cheap drone there and see what I could do. But, um, yeah, I flew, I flew near, I flew the drone near some high RF sources. And it began to give me warnings about compass interference and all that kind of stuff. So, I might just, um, you know, I might just try it, but... Uh, yeah. You know, Ken, oh, do you know him personally? 
that would be cool. I always threaten to go to one of his meetups and hang out, you know. He always has these meetups all over the place. So, um, and Ken, uh, you know, Ken's a really cool dude. Um, but Ben, that's really nice to hear, you know. Yeah, I'm a part 107, and I, you know, I do part 107 things, you know. <laughs> so, um, how do winds affect the drone? And the winds actually, so occasionally if you, if you operate, and you it encounters high winds i think and for high winds they really mean more than like 25 miles an hour it will give you a warning saying high wind warning land as soon as possible right but realistically you can kind of you can you can use a drone you know i have flown in high wind conditions i don't recommend it but if you keep it you know away from people and away from hazards and such you're kind of good to go but you just got to um, you just got to be careful. Um, Mini two is a great drone, and um, yeah, Austin spin up convention that's cool. Yeah, DJI Spark. Yeah, I have the Mavic two, and Mavic three is coming. So, you know, shh, Mavic three. Mavic three looks like a really great drone. So um, yeah, what else you want to know about history? I'll tell you a little bit about history in Trinidad, though. And, you know, this was something, I bet Nigel could back me up on this. So, um, back in Trinidad, how amateur radio started there was actually, uh, huh, yeah, no, 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 60 mile an hour winds, forget it, you know, um, yeah. So, legend has it that in Trinidad, the first, the first contact was made, and this is the info I got from TTARS, the Amateur Radio Society that um, in 1929, they had, a, they had a contact with an airline co-pilot, which we now call first officer. And um, the Colin Fraser was the guy's name. And then he had the, uh, the operator that he made contact with was um, SR Conley W3BCR from Pennsylvania, United States. Okay. And this is, this is legend. Okay. This is, I'm not, I can't really verify this. Eventually, when Trinidad got call signs, they got the, the call sign VP4CF. So Trinidad, you, before it became 9Y4 and 9Zulu4, they were a British dependency, and actually they became, um, they used to, to have call signs begin with V for Victor, so it was VP4, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's cool about the drone club, you know? That's cool about the drone club. Um, Ben, you know, the, the, the mini two is actually supposed to be good in high winds. So, you know, yeah. So, um, right. So yeah. Anyway, so back in the day now, amateurs used to actually be able to broadcast stuff too, but, um, some of them used to just do it illegally anyway. So there was a guy who used to broadcast cricket results on 40 meters and I guess they didn't like that, and the police kind of seized the equipment. You know, they said he didn't have a license. So eventually they got licensing and such. And then, of course, post-war, they had a lot of changes. Um, the government came and, and put licensing into effect. And um, so when I first got licensed in Trinidad, actually it was at the telecom division of the office of the prime minister, at that time, right? They didn't really have a formal telecom regulating authority. They had this little division in the office of the prime minister. And then later on when they did all the reform of telecom, they had a, um, they formed a telecommunications authority of Trinidad and Tobago, T-A-T-T. So, yeah. And anyway, the, um, so after the war, Hams, um, you know, became licensed and then we formed a radio club, and the club would do a lot of activities together. They formed um, two clubs, the Amateur Radio Society of Trinidad and Tobago, and then the South Trinidad Amateur Radio Society. And then um, those kind of like petered out, and then they had uh, the Amateur Radio Society of Trinidad and Tobago became what we know as the Trinidad and Tobago Amateur Radio Society. So TTARS eventually became incorporated by an act of parliament. Now, um, they have the president of Trinidad and Tobago as their, um, as their patron. 
And when the president was um, A.N.R. Robinson, Arthur N.R. Robinson, was um, so, you know, we met him, you know, and I shook his hand, right? All members of TTAR sh um, met the president and shook his hand. A.N.R. Robinson was actually the prime minister at one time. He was from Tobago. And um, he survived the, the coup attempt of 1990. And then basically after that, of course, his party lost election. But eventually they regained election, kind of like in a tie, 17-17-2. And they kind of brokered with him that, well, okay, we'll form a coalition government with you, but I want to be the president, right? And then that was part of the deal. He died later on. He was a controversial figure because he he was um, he instituted some very severe economic austerity measures that a lot of people didn't like. Like for example, they cut all public servants' pay by ten percent. They claimed it was a loan, right? That they'd be paid back this money, but it never happened. Some of them got government bonds and such, and you know they're very angry about it. But, um, yeah, they cut everybody. Imagine that. They, you know, they just come across the board and cut your salary by 10%. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, who else is in the chat here? Um, hi, T. Ray. Nice to see you. And uh, hi, um, let's see, who else here? Uh, yeah. Haley, you know, yeah, I can't, um, I don't know if you're, I don't, I, I really can't answer your question offhand. Um, if you have a 10, 11 meter radio and a separate two meters, some two antennas so close. So I actually had a situation. I didn't, I don't operate 11 meters, but I can tell you that I had an HF radio and a VHF, UHF radio in a car. My, one of my recent videos on all band radios kind of talks about this a little bit. I had HF antennas and VHF antennas close by. It was no problem. I would be on HF transmitting at hundred Watts then I still be able to, to hear people on the local repeaters. So it's not a problem. Okay. All right. Um, you'd love to find radio radio to handle 10, 11 and two, but no, it doesn't exist. You know why? Because FCC regulations do not allow it period. So, um, yeah. So anyway, yeah. So you cannot find a radio with 11 meters and another band legally. You can probably, have a radio and modify it, but I'm not going to tell you how to. You're going to have to figure that out on your own. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to tell people how to do their thing. At the same time, I don't want to encourage people to do that kind of stuff, you know. But, um, yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of little things. Occasionally, I might do, do a few chats on history and such like that, you know. But um, let's see how that goes. So I'm going to tie the ribbons on it tonight. And uh, thank you for joining live with Rhea. Um, just a programming note on the 19th. That is next um, weekend, I believe. That's next Sunday. Yeah, I'm going to start this stream uh, half an hour later. Because um, uh, Frank Tank Radio, he wants to do a uh, stream to celebrate his one hour. His one year on YouTube. So, you know, I don't want to clash with him. Right, so he's gracious enough to do that, and um, you know, if you enjoyed this content, like and subscribe, and um, I'll see you in the next one. I have a few videos coming up. I'm trying to do a video almost every day until Christmas, until December 25th, and then you know, I'm trying to do that basically some short videos to teach people and stuff. And you know, while I have the spare time, because after Christmas, I'm probably gonna get you know, in the new year. I'm going to get um, sucked back into a lot of things at work and, you know, we'll see how that goes. So, yeah. Yeah, so, you know what? Um, so, Paperwork Ninja, I can tell you that um, the you can actually get a, an all-band radio, like an ICOM 7000 or 706 Mark II G. And, you know, that'll have basically all the HF bands, 6, 2, you know, etc. So... Yeah, I don't know. But, um, yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, Nigel, thank you for all. Thank you all for joining. And, um, you know, 
the live streams, if you want us to listen to what happened yesterday, I have live streams and ARL has their own live streams. My live streams are not official ARRL stuff. I just do it because I enjoy ham radio. They have their stuff as well too. All right. 73. See you around next time.